Wait, remember holes? Uh, well, I never been to camp before. Dirt? Shovels? Venomous lizards? Digging holes in the desert sure sounds like the perfect setting for our classic Disney film here, Holes. In fact, 20 years ago from the day I posted this video, April 18th, this film originally hit theaters and nothing has made me feel more old than knowing that I went to see this film opening weekend in 2003. But this video isn't about my realization that life moves too fast for me to catch up to it. We are here to celebrate this film in general. Essentially revisit it, see how it holds up, and learn about some fun extras along the way. What we aren't going to do is compare it to the book, which has the same name, Holes. Because it was something we read as a classroom in school, and if anyone picked me for popcorn reading, ooh, I was not a happy camper. Speaking of not-so-happy campers, Holes tells the tale of kids at a juvenile detention camp that they are sent to instead of jail, where every day they do what the title of the book says. But it's so much more than that. Filled with a generationally entangled family curse, a harsh look at the reality of our past, and even some CGI lizards. This movie has it all. As someone who is both a fan of this movie but who also hasn't watched it in at least the past decade, I felt nostalgically drawn towards giving it a rewatch and wow, there is a lot to talk about here. So let's take a look at the star-studded, dirt and dust-filled world of holes. So uh, where's the lake? Couple things to note right off the bat. First, this was the early 2000s, and there was one TV kid actor that was starting his rise, and that's Shia LaBeouf. This was his biggest movie role away from TV yet, putting him center stage coming right off the incredible television run of both the entirety of Even Stevens and his heartbreaking performance for the TV movie for Disney, True Confessions. If you haven't seen that movie, please watch it. Disney wasn't done with Shia just yet, and with Holes, well, Disney knew how to bring their Disney Channel audience to the theaters. So right away, some pretty great casting for your main lead, at least for the main lead of the kids in the film, as they also have heavily marketed the adults that would appear in the film, I guess in a way to sell it more to parents coming to see the movie. Because trust me, there weren't any nine-year-olds clamoring to see John Voight in the role of Mr. Sir. You think that's funny? But in saying that now as an adult and a film enthusiast, yeah, this cast is pretty stacked here. Sigourney Weaver, John Voight, Patricia Arquette, Tim Blake Nelson, Henry Winkler, Eartha Kitt, the list just goes on. The director of the film, Andrew Davis, was pretty much known for more action-based movies, so when it came to agreeing to direct Holes, it was something that he felt could offer a more creative venture, that he knew he was capable of doing. He even got the author of the book, Lewis Sacker, to jump aboard and worked closely with him to adapt the book into a screenplay, and how it should all be paced. So then it was time to shoot this sucker, and to make things more fun, this film would shoot for 10 weeks in the summer of 2002 in California, with a lot of it being outside in temperature exceeding 120 degrees Fahrenheit. Things were going to get sweaty, but one of the biggest changes that people will point out from the book compared to the movie is the look of the main character, where throughout the book he starts off heavyset, continuously losing weight as the story goes on from sweating and working in the heat all day. But for the production, they decided to have the main character just already be skinny, as they couldn't ask that kind of demand from a teenager over the course of the shoot to lose a significant amount of weight for real. Finding a chubby boy that could then toughen up and lose weight was, you know, virtually impossible to ask of a teenager. Dang it, did I just compare it to the book? My bad, I'll try not to do that again. But let's get into the movie itself as we start out with some holes being dug in the desert, showcasing how dirty and dusty this film is going to get. We see a group of kids in jumpsuits digging their own holes as the heat is really starting to get to them, as we notice how limited their water supplies are, which clues us in to the nicknames that these boys have, as we focus here on a character who's nicknamed Barf Bag, who purposely goes and gets bitten by a rattlesnake. One, the hospital would be a way better place than here, and two, it's not the worst thing that can get you out there. This cuts and transitions us to a pair of shoes flying through the air as our main character Stanley Yelnats, the fourth, the last name's just Stanley backwards, as all the boys that continue down the generations take the first name of Stanley, and this Stanley is generation four. Now, which starter is he going to choose? My bet is on Piplup. A water Pokemon may come in handy in just a bit. These flying shoes end up landing right on him, and we hear narration about there being some sort of Yelnats family curse, 
specifically about being at the wrong place at the wrong time. So naturally on his way, running back home after being gifted from the heavens these shoes, he gets stopped by the police as they assume he's the one that stole these shoes, which we would find out shortly why these shoes would warrant a very aggressive response coming up. At his place with his mother, father, and grandfather, we see a messy household with his father trying to come up with the perfect remedy for getting rid of foot odor. So there looks like there's a reason to at least have so many random pairs of shoes in the apartment, but the men in the family are very superstitious of the Yelnats curse, and young Stanley heads to court over this whole incident and is sentenced to 18 months at Camp Green Lake, a juvenile correctional detention camp facility. I don't know if there's any other words I can add to emphasize what it is at this point. That is located in the middle of the desert instead of him being sentenced to the slammer. So now Stanley heads towards the camp in a Texas youth bus as we see what seems like a tiny town, with everyone in orange jumpsuits and nothing but holes around the camp for miles. Dim to the desert. Dig here. Monday at 8, 7 central. Upon Stanley's arrival at Camp Green Lake, he notices that there's actually no lake at all, and he meets the warden, or who at first we think is the warden. He's more of the right hand to the warden, who has all of the power when the warden's not around. He's a tough, no-nonsense person who makes it very clear how serious this place is, and just how awful it's going to be for Stanley. Noting that there are no fences around the perimeter, no guard towers keeping watch, just miles and miles of desert with various deadly animals and insects, with no water source for quite some ways out. You'd be eaten by vultures before you'd even make it that far. But at least he's not in jail, I guess. Boys, the rules are simple. You are to dig one hole each day that is five feet deep and five feet in diameter, no more, no less. But we are clued into a few things about the deadly creatures out there. Whereas we already know about the rattlesnakes being a problem, but those guys aren't the scariest critters out there, we are warned about the yellow spotted lizards, which have a nearly instant effect of causing death after biting you. And they can also be pretty aggressive. We will touch more on this later when it's important, but foreshadowing sure is fun. We also meet the next person under this not warden guy, whose name was Mr. Sir, by the way. So here's the camp counselor, Dr. Pendanski, who comes off pretty nice right away when we first get introduced to him, being the softest one of the adults yet, but still having this nasty side to him as we get introduced to the other campers, specifically Detent, where Stanley will be taking over the spot that Barfbag had, as the doctor dishes out a dose of being an annoying adult that picks on kids for them not being so smart, aiming most of his jokes at a silent kid named Zero. But yeah, we get to meet the whole crew, X-Ray, Squid, Armpit, Magnet, Zigzag, and of course, Zero. All of these are their nicknames, as Pendanski only refers to them as their actual names, which always pisses them off. And as we'll see Stanley later on use one of their real names and get a swift lesson in never forgetting to use their nicknames, as he starts to realize more and more how much this place is going to suck. Something is off about Zero though. Aside from getting picked on by the counselor, he just doesn't talk. And that is until he has this weird interest in Stanley. Finally speaking up as the rest of the group are all in disbelief that Zero said something in general. He asks further about the shoe incident as Stanley was speaking about his story of why he was in here in the first place, as we learn that the shoes he got in trouble for stealing belonged to Clyde Livingston, a pro baseball player who donated these valuable shoes of his to charity. But what hurt his defense in the long run, you know, of just randomly coming across these pair of shoes, or I guess them coming across him, is that he was a massive fan of this baseball player, with his room at home during a search from the cops being shown to be covered in a whole bunch of merch from that player specifically. But all the campers in the morning are woken up even before the sun is out so they can get ready to head out and start digging their hole for the day. We learn about a reward system that if you end up finding something, you report it and if the warden deems it interesting, based off whatever it is, then you get the rest of the day off from digging a hole. While that sounds pretty fishy, we are assured that digging these holes is only for the benefit of the campers themselves. It builds character and possible heat stroke. Throughout the movie, we get two other stories at play aside from the modern day story at the camp. One that wraps up quickly in its base story that takes place the furthest back but ties in heavily to the overall plot and specifically the characters, and another that is placed throughout the film as we learn more about the past of this area that plays into the story today. The first backstory we get heads back the furthest, where we hear the tale of Stanley Yelnats IV's no good, dirty, rotten, pig-stealing great-great-grandfather, who, while trying to figure out how to earn 
earn the hand of a fair maiden, he must win the acceptance of the girl's father, who is courting off his daughter. Against Azamat from Borat, well, I guess this movie was three years before Borat, semantics, who has offered the father a really big pig, which the father is into that gift over this guy's who's just wanting to offer his heart. So he turns to a fortune teller named Madame Zeroni that offers him a pig that he must carry up a mountain to a water source to help nurture it into a pig large enough to beat out this other man. But before he leaves, the deal only works one way. You can have the pig, but notes that if he doesn't come back for her to bring her up the mountain, then him and his whole family will be cursed from there on out. So of course he takes the pig and begins doing what he can to raise it into a large pig. And after some time has passed when the pigs are presented to the father, the pigs weigh the same. So the father leaves the decision to his daughter and to Yelnat's surprise, she has to think about it, even though he already assumed that he's the surefire choice that she wanted all along. Before she even makes her decision, he bows out over all of this, tells them to keep the pig and catches a boat ride that will bring him to America. But there was one thing that he forgot to do, as Madame Zeroni causes the curse to set in, as the lineage of Stanley Yelnats would begin starting with this guy's firstborn son, which plays into the lore of the other flashbacks we'll see throughout the film, where we hear all about kissing Kate Barlow, an outlaw that ran with a dangerous group to rob from banks and stagecoaches as she leaves her victims with a lipstick-covered smooch on their head. Stanley Yelnats I ties in initially to the story through being robbed by Kate, but not killed by her. She only stole what he had on board, like this chest. But from here, we will tie back into this story as we move along. Back at the dig site, we see how fast Zero is at digging holes, as the others also finish not too long after, but Stanley is still finishing up his as the sun leaves the sky for the day, being the last person back to camp being surprised by Mr. Sir, who holds a gun directly at him. But after this shock, it was actually aimed at a yellow-spotted lizard right behind him. A very CGI yellow-spotted lizard, and Mr. Sir even eviscerated it off the face of the earth, and its face off of its face. I don't even want to show you this part, where we get a close-up of the gruesome aftermath of this little fella. Now, let's finally chat about this thing, the yellow-spotted lizard. Well, here in the film, these Texas-based lizards, well, they aren't real. And for shooting this movie, they worked with real lizards that they brought in that had a certain look to them, but were not yellow-spotted, nor were they a threat. And they ended up mostly having them in the film as CGI or random set dressing, so it is what it is. But yellow-spotted lizards are technically real, except they look like this, and they are more so found in Central and South America than North America. But they are venomous, so that part at least still checks out. There's a little fun animal fact for you today. But now the days start coming and they won't stop coming and more and more holes are dug, with the narration backdrop of Stanley writing to his mother about his experience here, as he lies about it all, mentioning how it feels like a regular summer camp, and it's fun more so than a prison. But this was all in the effort of making his parents, specifically his mom, not worry about him. He doesn't want to cause more stress as the family is dealing with a lot currently, as we'll see. He then gets picked on for even writing letters to his parents as the other campers have been conditioned to feel like they are unloved and unthought of. From their own personal experiences and what this environment at the camp breeds. Later on when digging, Stanley finds a fossil of some fish that are pretty cool, but not cool enough to excite the warden so he doesn't get the rest of the day off, which kind of starts setting up some red flags about what findings even qualify as something of interest. But hey, at least we have proof that this barren desert was once a lake, and possibly a green one. We start getting a taste of the flashbacks where we meet Sam, an onion farmer who brings his goods to the town from his boat, the Mary Lou, across the Green Lake, and he also has a donkey of the same name. His goods are what he has made with his onions, claiming them to be the cure for everything, and can aid in fending off those pesky yellow-spotted lizards. He sells the elixirs and mixtures to those in town who hear him out, but another reason he enjoys this town so much is Catherine, who runs the schoolhouse, teaching kids and adults alike. When we cut back to the holes, X-Ray comments to Stanley that the next time he finds something, he should give it to him instead, as in a vague threat that it wouldn't be fair for him, who just just got there to have a day off when he hasn't ever had one for the long length that he's been there for. Things continue to not be so great for Stanley as later he accidentally gets in a confrontation with this other guy, but the rest of his cabin crew back him up to calm this other guy down, as we see that Zero, again for some weird reason, was looking out for Stanley, having a pool ball clenched in his hand and ready to 
fight, but it was de-escalated, so no worries at all. Stanley also earns the nickname Caveman, and we see that there is some bonding starting to happen within the group, but also some internal conflicts between them here and there. Stanley receives a letter back from his mom as we cut to seeing her write it, as stuff around her seems to be a mess, as there is troubles with the landlord and being able to afford rent. But she mentions that this note made her feel like a good mother who could afford to give her son the camp experience, even if it isn't the way Stanley made it sound. So his curated candor and writing gave her a moment of peace in a room full of madness. Zero stands behind him as he reads this, as Stanley says that he doesn't want him reading over his shoulder like that. But Zero says that he can't read and opens up to Stanley, asking him for help to teach him. Stanley rejects this at first, as we see more of a brotherhood build between Stanley and the rest of the boys. Next time we see them in the whole field, Stanley finds something again. This time at first looking like a bullet, but really turns out to be a lipstick container with the initials KB on them. Reluctantly, Stanley lets X-Ray take it, but tells him to wait before turning it in. Since they've already worked so much of the day already, just wait until early the next day to claim you found it so you can get the whole day off. So he does just that. The next morning, once it's turned in, the warden comes to check it out, and we see that this is something in relation to what she thinks is worthy of a day break, and our clue into why they are digging the holes aside from character building. Because of how great of an item she claims this to be, she sends X-Ray back to the camp and everyone working still gets their cantinas refilled with water before they come together as a group effort to start digging one giant hole in that area where this item was found, or where X-Ray pretends he found it. This also gives us our first real moment with the real warden, and how on a dime she can go from seemingly kind and reasonable to mean and demanding. The mean part is taken out on the counselor as she shows the rest of the campers some love, like longer shower privileges and a nicer dinner. It's a pretty sweet deal, but what can this giant mystery be leading up to? Something is off about them all having to dig in one central location together now, and the warden seems to be on some sort of mission. We enter another flashback to see Sam once again who is eyeing Catherine, as the two then show a nice rapport between them, which quickly becomes flirtatious as he starts helping her fix up the schoolhouse, as she starts giving him some of her jarred peaches. Just as a thank you. Remember those, they will be on the test. We also get to see Mr. Walker, a wealthy spoiled prick who has a liking to Catherine, but is also a complete jerk, especially during her night class that was helping adults get better educated, where he mocks one of them by saying, Duck may swim on the lake, but my daddy owns the lake. And even after that, he asks her out on a date, but of course she rejects him, and then building up some suspicion that Sam has been spending a lot of time with her. Sam keeps helping her out with fixing stuff up, saying, I can fix it, as she finds more things for him to work on, coming to her once again when she was crying, saying, I can fix it, as they share a passionate kiss. But who's that out there in the window, being rained on? It's none other than Mr. Walker himself, where we later cut to Sam not being around, the schoolhouse being lit on fire, and a distraught Catherine running to the sheriff for help, only to find a drunk man who tries making a move on Catherine and mentions that they are hanging Sam. During this time, the sheriff mentions that for him, a black man to be kissing a white woman is illegal, and she responds that she should be hung as well as she kissed him back, where it's then noted that it's not illegal for her to do that. No one at this time in any position of power thinks twice about Mr. Walker's story, especially with how deep-rooted the racism is, as a hunt for Sam would then take place, showing us that his donkey was shot dead as we then cut to a silhouetted boat chase of Sam paddling away from a personal-sized steamboat, one that belonged to Mr. Walker with the only backlight being the moon until we hear a gunshot, seeing Sam instead shot dead for trying to escape, with his body falling into the lake. After a night of coming to terms with what happened and what she'll do now, she arrives back at the sheriff's office the next day and shoots him dead right then and there with no second thought, leaving him with that kiss he wanted the night before right on his head as it leaves a lipstick imprint, where she then goes on to become the famous outlaw kissing Kate Barlow. The lipstick we found earlier, no doubt, was Kate's. Starring Shia LaBeouf of Disney Channel's Even Stevens. I'm a math daddy, you know, and I play armpit. And this is all you jackasses got to show for it. After nothing is really found in the digging location, they all are ordered to go back to their own holes as the next day, one of the boys steals Mr. Sir's sunflower seeds. Then as he turns his truck back around after noticing that they're gone, Stanley takes the fall for all of them as the bag was poorly hidden in his hole last second. Without snitching, he gets pulled away with Mr. Sir and they head back to the warden's office as they now have a conversation with her. And the warden seems to be playing more more calm and quiet as tension starts to build, 
world. Mr. Sir is all proud that he is disciplining him, but mentions that he thinks he's just covering for one of the others. The warden starts talking about rattlesnakes and their venom being harmless in some ways, as it's mixed in with her nail polish. I guess just as a, a quirky, maybe evil person thing, but in reality, we do get this scene. <laughs> Yeah, she claws him with the venom nails for wasting her time with this, as maybe the detention factor of this place is just a giant cover-up, and cover-up is what Mr. Sir will surely be needing. I mean, just look at his face after this. It's us. Uh, it's disgusting. Stanley gets sent back to the holes where everyone is surprised that he didn't snitch about the sunflower seeds, but also sees that Zero has dug his hole for him in the meantime, something he's fast at and has stated earlier in the film that he likes to do. He tells Stanley that he knows he didn't steal the shoes all along, but doesn't go into it further just yet. Zero wants to dig every hole for Stanley in return for Stanley spending extra time helping him learn how to read. And now we start to really meet the person behind Zero named Hector. Hector Zeroni. Hmm. Where have I heard that name before? Anyway, Hector wants to learn how to read in the efforts of helping him hire detectives to find his mother after he explains how one day she disappeared and he was left on his own, causing him to become homeless and fending for himself on the streets for some time. Back at the digging site, the other boys are pretty mad at Stanley for having Zero still dig his holes for him, but he's still somewhat participating regardless. The kids all start taking their comments too far as Zigzag pokes at Stanley too much, or even the counselor is encouraging Stanley to fight back at it. So the two of them get into a scuffle, but Hector jumps in and starts choking out Zigzag and not letting him go no matter what, taking it even further as the counselor gets scared about this and fires his gun in the air, stopping them. The warden and Mr. Sir pull up as the kids try to explain what happened, but the other kids end up snitching on Stanley, saying that he isn't digging his own holes, doing so even after he didn't rat them out or get anyone else in trouble just the other day. Hector gets pretty heated as the counselor picks on him some more for not being smart, thinking that Stanley teaching him to read is useless and a waste of time. So Hector gets handed a shovel from him to get back to work, but the comments go too far and he smacks him in the face with the shovel. So not only is Mr. Sir looking pretty rough with those gashes on his face, but now Pendanski's face has been flattened. Right after this, Hector goes running into the desert away from the camp, as the adults don't really chase after him, at least not hard enough. Later on, privately meeting, knowing that if he doesn't come back, no one outside of this place is waiting for him. They can just get rid of the evidence of him being there in the first place, and it's like, hey, Hector, who? Stanley walks in on them just at the right time as he lets them know he hears how terrible of people that they are. The boys ponder on what might happen to Zero out there as they offer each other different thoughts of what could happen as we see a clip of Hector sometime during the day collapsing in the desert. We also cut back to learning about God's Thumb, a place of refuge in the desert that tales tell of only being able to survive out there by finding it and climbing up this rock structure, a place that Stanley Yelnats the first apparently survived after being stranded by Kate, thanks to being robbed by her. In the meantime, another new kid gets brought to the camp who gets nicknamed Twitch because, well, he twitches. You should have seen me behind the wheel of that Mustang convertible. Woo. But he's there for stealing cars and joyriding them. So Stanley silently starts putting together a plan. When they all head out the next day to the holes, the rest of D-Tent starts to distract Mr. Sir for a moment as Stanley gets inside of the truck and has Twitch tell him how to operate it real quick as he pulls off, dragging Mr. Sir for a bit before he ultimately crashes the truck into one of the holes, as then he he just takes off on foot into the desert after Hector. On the lam, we get to see some brief looks into the dangers of what we were warned about. This whole time with a beating sun shining bright, yellow spotted lizards owning the territory, and skulls of animals picked apart by vultures laying around as we see what seems like story content for the audience of footage of Sam making a journey through the desert with his donkey. But if we look back to when Stanley is arriving into the desert and he sees a man we don't know yet at that time and his donkey, it serves as these desert visions that symbolize and showcase the dark past as we, along with Stanley, understand it through these storylines of the past and finding the connections in the modern day, leaving you to kind of infer if Stanley is having these visions or if they're just trying to serve the audience. Eventually, Stanley finds a flipped over wooden boat that he checks underneath to find Hector surviving from the heat in there. While there is no water to drink, there are some jars that contain something that Hector calls sploosh that surprisingly tastes good, that they both end up finishing that turns out to be fermented peaches. The same peaches from who? Catherine. Correct, Catherine, from back in the day when she gave them to Sam. See, I told you they would be on the test and you passed with flying colors. When they get out from under the boat, seeing that it was called the Mary Lou, they notice a rock structure like no other in the distance, God's Thumb. So they make their way to it, while everyone back at camp champions Caveman as brave and really awesome for stealing the truck and heading out after Zero. 
but the climb up the mountain for God's thumb isn't easy. First, when Hector was helping Stanley up with a shovel, it resulted in slicing both of his palms open, as well as Hector nearly fainting and falling off the mountain at one point and Stanley saving him. He decides then to carry Hector the rest of the way up God's thumb as we hear audio from Madame Zeroni, who started the whole curse, reciting the promise to come back and bring her up the mountain for the water to strengthen up. Yes, if you couldn't tell from earlier, the Zeroni bloodline meets with the Yelnats once again as they mirror fulfilling that promise. My only complaint with this scene is that they really go out of their way to make it obvious what is happening. Rather than playing the scene without the audio to leave the viewer a chance to understand and take it all in, it would have felt more impactful this way rather than to layer in the obvious audio that explains this. And yes, at the top of the mountain, God's Thumb houses its own water source for them to drink from, quickly bringing Hector back to better health, as they also discover Sam's onion farm. Nestled in its own sanctuary as when they eat it, they instantly start feeling better. Remember, those onions have the power to cure anything. We see some symbolism referring to the curse being lifted, and the promise, in a way, of the Yelnats helping a Zeroni being completed. We immediately see this as when we cut back to the Yelnats apartment, Stanley III finally figures out the perfect mixture to make his foot odor spray work, being the blend of none other than peaches and onions. How genuinely poetic but it also will be more poetic shortly. Zero then mentions to Stanley that it was his fault that he's here as he was the one who stole the shoes, not for value, but for necessity of surviving in the streets, but got scared when the cops were after him, throwing them off a bridge and right onto Stanley for his troubles to start being at the wrong place at the wrong time, being the direct result of a Zeroni. Hector would eventually be arrested and sent here for stealing shoes from Payless. I guess he really did pay less. Stanley isn't mad though. He considers it destiny that it all happened, and when you connect every generational dot, yeah, their family bloodlines are intertwined in fate. Back at the camp, Stanley's attorney is there and not happy with the camp or how it's run at all when she's informed that Stanley just isn't there and now knows that something's up, being angry and promising to return with a court order to figure out everything that the camp is not telling her and to a further extent, find out more than she bargained for. Stanley, for some reason, was going to be released, but we don't know what is fully happening just yet. But these two here continue their shared moment of feeling at peace for once and enjoying that they found this place. Stanley also says he feels lucky and says let's dig one more hole as we then get treated to one more flashback for kissing Kate as this time Kate is sitting against the flipped over Mary Lou in the now dried up green lake as she is approached by an hallucination of Sam greeting her as what feels like a message from beyond before then being approached by the man who started this Mr. Walker and his company who used to be a former younger student of hers which makes it even creepier but they corner her with weapons drawn as she acts all nonchalant not giving up the details of where she even buried all of the riches she's acquired over her outlaw spree, choosing to die with these secrets as her life feels at its end, grabbing a yellow spotted lizard that crawled out from under the boat and taking a direct bite from it as she fades from our plane of existence, dying in the same spot Sam did. Stanley has this idea of the kiss, meaning it marks the spot, so the lipstick in that case, representing the kiss, with him knowing now where to look, which was the original hole he dug and marked with a rock, which was where they didn't look during the group dig from before. And eventually when looking, they end up hitting something that turns out to be a locked chest that they pull out while at the same time the warden, Mr. Sir, and the counselor appear, but before they take it from the boys, a group of yellow spotted lizards crawl out all over them, as well as the chest in a stalemate of nothing happening for now as they just sit around. This whole thing is happening, it's just been amazing. One of the joys of making the movie to me was working with Lewis Sacker. They aren't biting or attacking the boys because of the onion being this safe repellent for them to give the yellow spotted lizards no interest. But the adults can't do anything about this right now. They tell Stanley that he was supposed to be set free, his attorney came by and they cleared him of the crime, but since he wasn't there, he wasn't released. The warden gives us a flashback of her own, where it shows that her grandpa was so obsessed with digging holes in this area and finding Kiss and Kate's treasure. I'm tired of this, Grandpa! That's too damn bad! Well, excuse me! <laughs> 
And the reason he's so obsessed? Well, it was none other than Mr. Walker himself, making the warden his granddaughter, and now equally as obsessed with finding that very chest right there. The amount of tying everyone's story in just works so well, and genuinely not one reveal or connection feels forced, but quite plausible actually. Now with the sun coming up and the stalemate still stale, the court system comes riding in deep as they confront the warden and her underlings and see Stanley held there along with all the lizards. But when the warden starts lying about everything, Stanley just shakes off the lizards, fully calling her out and so does Hector. Especially when she tries to take the treasure chest, Hector speaks up. Thanks to learning exactly how to read, he says that the chest says Stanley Yelnats on it. The very chest Kate stole from Stanley Yelnats the first, making it this Stanley Yelnats property now, which eats away at her. The law now gets jurisdiction over the camp and fully begins their investigation into what is happening here. Stanley says he won't go home though unless Hector comes with him. So as they agree to this, we find out some revealing truths and that these three are all placed into custody, especially with Mr. Sir getting his name revealed as Marion and that he was under probation and not allowed to own a gun, getting him in even more trouble. But for the endangerment of the kids and the unethical labor they were put through, they would all be in big trouble and the camp would be seized and shut down, with all of the campers being let go and set up with their own real counselors. But before we leave the camp, a miracle happened. It finally rained for the first time in forever, and started drenching the dry land once more, as the most satisfying thing also happened, when the warden pleased one last time just to see what's in the chest, to fulfill her knowledge of just knowing it's real or not. Stanley denies her of that, leaving her treasure-hunting madness brain to rot in a cell somewhere. Now back at Stanley's apartment, free of being in that camp along with Hector there, they all together open the chest, and shoot, it's actually filled with crazy amounts of loot with treasures beyond their imagination that would be worth millions as Stanley makes sure that whatever it equals out to, Hector is entitled to half of it, which they all agree to, of course. Pushing forward a little bit, we see a bus station where Hector did end up figuring things out to get the best investigators he could to find his mother as she arrives there, explaining that she's been lost from him just as much as he's been lost from her. In the end, we all see that the Yelnats and the Zeronis are now intertwined once again as neighbor and neighbor, living a better life with nicer houses that take care of their families and accommodate gatherings of friends coming over. All the kids from D-Tent come over for this get-together, trading in sweating in the desert to playing in the pool instead. Clyde Livingston has made amends with both Stanley and Hector, and is even working with the families as he becomes the spokesperson for the foot odor spray Stanley Yelnats III would bring to the market, all coming together with the name Sploosh, bringing that combinations of peaches and onions representing Kate and Sam with the name that Hector Zeroni came up with for the product invented by a Yelnats. It all connects them and represents them. It saves the Yelnats family from their financial issues post-curse, beyond just the treasure chest, and it builds Hector a legacy for him and his family as they honor the past as the brand that they create that owns Sploosh is KB Industries. Green Lake was closed down and would possibly come back as a girls camp with it never being able to become what it once was before. We end the movie on a statue in the front yard of the house where it is holding up a shovel as the rest of the story elements that we may not have seen on screen or had in detail explained are written off as the holes that you just have to fill yourself. I guess you have to fill in the rest of the holes yourself. There's also this fun little post credit scene with Hector quoting Madame Zeroni about cursing the family. For always and eternity. Just a little fun thing they tossed in the end. When it comes to this film, I absolutely loved it, and seeing just how well it holds up, not only from the performances in the film, but from a writing aspect, how interconnected and important the story constantly feels, is genuinely impressive. And of course, a lot of thanks to this goes to the book, but also for how the author was able to adapt and slightly tweak things to fit a less than two hour film is worth a lot of praise on its own. There are moments that could be fleshed out further or some gaps that needed to be filled in, but they aren't crucial enough to ruin the movie, and heck, there's a book to read to do that in some aspects. While I wish some of the story's mysteries as they were getting resolved weren't as obvious visually and audibly through the editing, there was a significant level of pacing out each part that would open up more of the missing information, with constant things happening at first that make you go, well, why did that happen? Only to later get some more context to why that thing happened, and even later context to it that connects 
connects it all to something else. Back in the day, and by that I mean 2003, the film ended up performing fairly well, earning $71.4 million at the box office, having a $20 million budget to begin with, with the film living on to become a classic for the generation of kids that would grow up with it and hold on to it fondly. But from a critic standpoint, it reviewed very well, with some being surprised thinking that it would be something more kid-focused and juvenile than it turned out being, having more mature themes, tackling more important topics, and telling a compelling narrative. But this film was almost something else. Before Andrew Davis would get on board to direct this movie, another director was initially going to adapt the book into a film, but Disney got more than they bargained for as they were working with Richard Kelly, who at the time was writing and working on this film that would come out in 2001 called Donnie Darko, which would become its own cult classic. The problem with that is that the script that he would end up writing in 1999 for Holes became something so drastically different from what the Holes book was was, both in tone, age demographic, and even the setting, putting the film into this post-apocalyptic era, sometime after some war, where the characters in the movie are speaking in philosophical tongue, mixing in extremely vulgar moments with visceral violence, leaving the only true similarities to the book are that the holes, well, they will be dug. The full script can be easily found online now, as Richard Kelly himself even tweeted it out back in 2016, so I implore you to deep dive the script if you have any interest in seeing the what could have been if Disney didn't take Richard off the project, because oh boy, it sure is not the same movie we have here. Since the film, Shia LaBeouf has stated many years later that he doesn't think the film is bad, but he's not too proud of it, saying he thinks it's just okay. Cleo Thomas, who played Hector, is in the mixture of the current entertainment medium and Hollywood still acting in some projects, but also being a musician and a YouTuber, complete with a whole online personality and brand, integrated in spaces like the gaming side of things. All of the Detent boys work together in writing and performing the song Dig It for the movie, which was used heavily for the marketing, especially on Disney Channel. And hey, shout out to the crew that had to dig somewhere around 400 real holes for this film. I hope you are all well compensated. It all just seemed like such a great effort putting this whole production together, having Lewis being involved to bring in the creator of the story made it feel that much more authentic to what he originally wrote. It surely wasn't the easiest shoot with long summer days filming in the heat, with Cleo even getting a heat rash at one point, and for Shia, he was double busy filming for this and the final season of Even Stevens. It just turned into a labor of love with legacy actors wanting to actively be a part of this story. Kid actors who put in great performances, and a director proving that he's not just an action filmmaker. While Cleo has noted that he'd love to be in a whole sequel movie, where it focuses on the way the characters have used their riches over the years, because, well, who wouldn't want to get work? There technically is a sequel to Holes, the book, kind of. It's more of a companion piece written by Lewis as well that brings you a survival guide to Camp Green Lake. Speaking of survival guides, I have a big Ned's Declassified School Survival Guide video coming soon. But as far as Holes, I'd love to know your personal thoughts on the film. Do you think it holds up today? Is it one of your favorites? Tell me all of that in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching. Like and subscribe for more. Later.